Welcome into the Financial Freedom Roundtable, where each week we break down complex financial topics so that you can more easily understand them, and more importantly, take action on your path to becoming financially free. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. Grateful to have you in the room. I'm Russ Morgan, the comment the idea guy. Mostly because, like a follow through guy, just didn't sound so cool to me. But enough about me for a moment. Let me introduce you, introduce you to my co-host, my partner. He's the stallion. He's the Italian stallion. He's got the license plate cover to prove it. Mr. Joe M. Uray. Stallion, good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon, my friend. So glad to be with you. Man, this is the second part of the Million Dollar Insights from the last 525,600 minutes. It seems like it's been a week since I said that before. Yeah, I was about to say that the first one was a mistake. The second one is just pure foolishness. So, but let's let's move on from the the karaoke moment, and let's get to the actual insights for us. Like these are behind the scenes that these coaches are spending with each of you as you're listening. You've been on calls with these guys. You've been, and if you have it, you have an opportunity, right? You need to go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash free call, jump on a call with them, and figure out what your right next thing is so that you can learn some of these things real time with each one of these coaches. They have so much to offer. Well, there is an unfair advantage to having access to the person who sees the deals, who has the deals constantly crumb across their desk. That's the reason this podcast was started is because we were having people come into our office on a one-on-one basis, sharing with us the deals that they were, they were doing, the things that they um, needed other people to get involved with them on, and we didn't have a way to share those things. We didn't have a way to inspire people. Joey, this is the exact reason why we started the podcast seven years ago, right? It was all about being able to share those opportunities that we were hearing on a one-on-one basis with other people. And initially, we thought it was going to be just a weekly conversations with people who had bought insurance policies with us. We had no idea that we were going to be creating financial coaching, that we would create a community with almost 8,000 people in it, that we would have people from all over the world listening to this podcast to be inspired to become financially free and having amazing guests come on each and every week to share different strategies in which they're doing. Nor did we have the insight to think about we were going to have this team of financial coaches who were doing amazing deals themselves and also having amazing conversations on a weekly basis with you and with people like you. So let's bring them in to this conversation. To my right, I got the piano man. We're all in the mood for passive income. And you have a C in the light, Mr. Matthew Hammond. Welcome back, Matthew. Hey, it's good to be back, Russ. Happy to be here. All right. So we're reflecting on what happened last year in 2023. Tell me one big moment, one, one, uh, one thing that stuck out to you about what you either did or saw last year? Well, I will say that the uh, the one thing that stood out to me was a deal gone wrong. I learned a lot from this deal. Uh, I learned the biggest insight I got from this deal is actually something that I learned or that I already knew, but it just reiterated the, the fact. Do not rely on the due diligence of others, which I totally went against character in doing that. And also, probably more importantly, don't let the tax tail wag the dog. Um, as much as I hate paying taxes, uh, losing money on a deal is far, far worse. And um, and so, even though even though I lost money on the deal, the the lessons that I took away from it um, are are better preparing me for the coming years and and my coming my uh, my ongoing investment strategy. I know that sometimes the the things that will help us in the future are the things from our past, right? So we don't repeat them. Shame on me for making you guys listen to my horrible singing twice. Uh, shame on you, Joey, for allowing me to do it and not stopping me. All right, let me get around the table here. we got a true financial Sherlock Holmes of our day. No problem too difficult to solve. If I had only known him earlier, I'd be so much richer, said everybody. Mr. Downtown Ernie Brown. Nice to see you, Ern. Man, good to be seen and grateful to be on this Show Me the Money podcast episode. What this feels like. <laughs> It is. Show me the money. Like this is an opportunity for for those who don't get a chance to sit in your chair, don't get a chance to to be on those phone calls that you're on, don't get a chance to, to maybe be a part of those mastermind meetings and one on one discussion groups that you're in to hear. So share with me one thing that stuck out for you from 2023. 
Yeah, well, you, you're asking like personal reflection. So I'm going to talk about personally <laughs> what has stood out, what I've learned. And uh, unfortunately, maybe fortunately, this is an ongoing lesson I think that I'm learning, which is do not expect what you do not inspect. Mm. And I thought of two particular areas that this has been true, things that I've realized is, is one in passive investing, I'm trusting other people to do the work. And therefore, they're the one who needs to be performing excellently. And I've realized, number one, that when I am engaged, being the encourager, the vision caster, uh, the one who is checking in, um, it seems like better work gets done. <laughs> more properties, more pieces of land get sold when I'm engaged compared to when I haven't been engaged. And so for me to want the best results, I need to be present in providing leadership, relationship, and vision in the business. The second thing um, has been in uh, a piece of property that we wanted to turn into a rental. I did not inspect the specific the assumptions that were made about the rental rates. And I had some ideas of what this property should rent for. Um, but I realized that the property manager who was marketing the property used wrong information <laughs> to come up with the market rate. And what that led to, it was a couple of months of the property being vacant before we dropped the rent rate down to um, something that would be attractive for the market. And what that meant for me is a few months of expense and a few months of no income. And so that was a lesson learned that uh, I want to, I want to, I want to have learned that. So I don't continue to not expect what I'm not inspecting. Yes. That's amazing. Love that. All right. Let me, let me get around the table to the king of Beham, man. It's the real estate himself. He's agnostic to his type as long as it produces cash flow. The multi talented Jamie O'Brien. Good to see you, Jamie. Man, good to be here, Russ. Just enjoying another day of paradise, my friend. Tell me about your reflections as we look back into the rearview mirror of 2023. Yeah. I mean, the biggest reflection I think I gathered from last year, and, and I always knew this, that's the crazy part, but I think it was really brought to light is uh, there's an old quote from old Henry Ford that says, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Right. And so I've seen, I think mindset controls everything and how we feel about ourselves and what is possible dictates what we do and how we act and how we behave. Right. And I think the coolest insight is I've seen dozens of people last year um, just change their thinking around what was even possible in their lives and create massive results through massive action. And so being around a group of people like this, a group of like minded people has held me accountable and, and holds other people accountable. And I just really enjoy that every single day. Uh, it seems like people are changing their mindset around what's even possible in their own lives. If you're not watching this live, you're missing just an am amazing moment as Jamie, the detective, sports his new 2024 mustache. Well done, sir. <laughs> Try to well bring done. in the year strong, my friend. Thank you for your service. <laughs> yeah. I must ask you a question, but I'm going to do it after we come back. So let's say everybody sit down at a virtual round table and belly up. Yeah. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now, here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. All right, this is a great opportunity for you to hear from these coaches individually. And I'm coming to you, Jamie, first, because I said I have, I must ask you a question. You got that amazing hair pillow going on right there above your upper lip. And I just thought you clearly have, have sniffed out a deal or seen a deal done this year in 2023. I'm sorry, last year. So tell me about the, the best deal that you saw done. 
man, I want to talk about one that I did personally, um, not to make the time about me. I saw a lot of ma- amazing deals done uh, this year, everything from people buying parcels of land and, and selling it four times what they bought it for on terms, guaranteeing cash flow for seven years. Um, I saw a lady turn her business into almost completely passive, removed herself from it, positioned it to sell for a massive profit because she was able to scale that business or remove herself from the day to day. But one that I did that I thought was cool. We're going to have to go back to 2022 uh, to talk about this because it took about 18 months, but it was the perfect, I think, combination of solving problems and opportunities find cash. And so I came across this deal previously back in 22 and a guy had this old beat up warehouse in Pelham, Alabama. It's kind of south of Birmingham here in town that uh, he had federal tax liens on. It was in probate. It was a mess, right? And he just had no idea what he needed to do with his property, but he wanted to get the cash out of it. And so long story short, we were able to go in and help him solve the problem with his tax liens, solve the problem with the probate, get it through that probate system, buy the property for what I think was a very, very fair price. Um, we didn't touch it other than clean it out. Uh, and within four months, we sold it making a 60% return on investment. But the coolest part is for us that I didn't buy that money with or that property with my money, right? I used other people's money to finance that purchase. So I also was able to provide an opportunity to a good friend of mine to finance this deal, make a great return on his money as we were working through uh, all the legal process to get everything cleared up. And it was a win-win for everyone involved. Man, I love that. How about for you, Matthew? Tell me about the greatest or biggest deal uh, that you saw done or maybe that you did in 2023. Well, I will say, I wish I could take credit for this. This was not my deal. This was a a guy I know um, in the short-term rental space. um, Since I do have a short-term rental business, I I know a lot of folks in that space. And he actually owns, uh, well, at the time, he actually owned... a couple uh, cabins up in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And um, and he bought them right at the right time. And they appreciate, they basically doubled in value in less than 12 months. And he was able to actually tap that equity in both of those cabins and purchase, I want to say it was four or five more properties across, across Tennessee, um, Maryland, and I want to say Florida as well. And uh, he was able to scale his, his short-term rental business uh, two to six short-term rentals in a matter of 12 months. And, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to appear to be, uh, to, to appear to be jealous. Um, but I, I am definitely jealous at his success. Um, but I'm totally rooting for him because that was a, that was amazing. Uh, dude, it's totally okay to be jealous. I mean, you know, like just go to God and, and prayer time and say, please, Lord, help remove this envy and jealousy in my heart because I was talking to a guy the other day that sold his business for like 45 million. And I'm like, good for you, bro. Like that's, that's awesome. You know, like, but in my heart, I'm like, dang it, man, (laughs) I could, I could do so much good. I could do so much good with, with 45 million, just, you know, so much opportunity. All right, Ern. Coming to you, man. Tell me, tell me about the greatest deal that you saw done, or maybe that you did in 2023. Yeah, well, I am. I'm ready for this. Yeah, last year it was uh, scaling time in my land business, and so I just want to talk about one deal that I thought was it just worked out perfectly. Love it. <laughs> you hate it when things don't work out, but you love it when things do work out perfectly. And I thought this was a great example. In June. Uh, We bought these four parcels of land from this one seller, and we paid $3,700 each for them. And three months later, we sold those same four parcels to one buyer, and we sold those each for $10,900. The way that we did that, though, was we collected down payment for each of those of $350 and sold them on terms. And that took uh, $150 a month per parcel. So, you know, summary took 10, a little over $14,000. And in four months, increased our passive income $600 a month. And so basically took 14 and turned it into 40, but better yet created $600 a month for the next six years. And (laughs) really excited about that one deal. 
That was one of 19 that we did last year. And so super excited about what that's going to lead into this next year. Uh, and Joey, you, you and I uh, are, are doing a, pot, uh, a webinar on kind of our land business. And just speaking to the land business, one of the things I think is super interesting is that not only can we create cash flow through something like this, residual income, but when we use our infinite banking systems to help finance it, like Joey and I were sharing some numbers, we had invested 400,000 and it turned it into 1.1 million or whatever it was over a short period of time. And it's like a 42% return. Not bad, right? I think, you know, Dave Ramsey would be okay with that number, but what he would be okay with Matthew is that we use an insurance policy. We use an insurance policy, a cash value, whole life policy. And what we did is we went into debt. <laughs> debt. Debt's good, man. It's good. Because we we actually borrowed against the insurance company's money using our insurance policy as collateral. And so what we had to do over the three years that we've had that land business is pay interest on that. It costs us about $45,000 in interest to earn that $1.1 million in value currently. It's a little over $20,000 a month in cash flow. And when you do the calculation on that, it was 320% return on investment. I don't know if that's good or not, but is that good? That's, that's just one of those things where you, you kind of get to see how all these things blend together. Well, Russ, back- Russ, you need to call into uh, Dave Ramsey's show and give him that case study. Cause I would <laughs> love to see him argue against this. <laughs> oh, oh man. Well, but, but here's the reality, Russ, we could talk about all the wins. But when we reflect, we also have to consider the lessons learned, the mistakes made, opportunities missed, if you will. And sometimes there are things that we did personally, and sometimes it's because we're in close proximity to other investors because we're in these masterminds and we're able to borrow their lessons. And to be honest, that's even better because we don't have to pay retail for the same mistakes. Now, uh, Ernie, I'm going to start with you this time. What would you say would be the biggest mistake either you made or, or saw someone else do? I'll just go back to what I mentioned at the beginning. Biggest mistake turned into a lesson learned, which was better inspecting the facts, assumptions that a property management company was making for me that I ended up looking into, but it took me two months to do so. And in the meantime, let the two months of probably unnecessary vacancy. Uh, vacancy absolutely kills profits for sure. Jamie, how about you? I'm going to, I'm going to phrase what Ernie said in a, in a different way. There's the old saying, trust, but verify, right? I failed at verify. So I, uh, uh flip houses as well as build real estate, uh, rentals and, and do a couple other things, but had a flip this year that we had been working on and trusted my team uh, to be doing the work and to be doing it on budget and uh, do, taking care of everything they said they were going to take uh, take care of. But if I could be vulnerable for just a minute, honestly, I spread myself too thin earlier this earlier last year and and really just was, had too many hats in the air. And I was not verifying what was happening at this property the way I should have been. Took my eye off that house and um, that led to major contractor issues, led to us being well over budget. Um, and in the end, it did it up to a big L on the, on the scoreboard. But, uh, as I already said, learned a lot through that process. Um, not only about what I need to do, uh, on my end as kind of a manager of projects or an asset manager, if you will, but also how to protect myself, um, when I'm working with people that I believe I can trust, uh, trust, but verify, right. Trust, but protect, um, been doing this for six years and I still learn something feels like every single year. So I think it comes back to investor DNA and also understanding the available amount of time and how many hats we're trying to juggle at one point in time. We can do a lot of things poorly, or we can focus on a few things and do them very well. If you've listened to our show for any length of time, you've heard us talk about infinite banking and how we were able to use that concept to create over $50,000 a month in passive income. But it's just not that easy to figure out how does this all connect into my own personal system? Stallion, that's why we created the Passive Income Operating System, bro. It shows you how to turn active income into passive income. It makes all the steps come together. If you would like to get access to it as a podcast listener, we've never given this away in public before. Go to whatswhatwallstreet.com forward slash P-I-O-S. There was nothing worse than walking into class when you're in school and the teacher saying, pop quiz day. 
Why? Because you are unprepared. Are you unprepared though for financial freedom? Don't be. Find out how close you are by taking our 30 second quiz at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash quiz. And I totally, uh, I see the shiny object syndrome opportunity. Um, sometimes it's not being spread too thin for, you know, you, you volunteer to be spread too thin and, and we definitely deal with that as well. Matthew, how about you? Yeah. I mean, I really, I hate to sound like a broken record, but, uh, but I really have to just kind of piggyback off of, uh, Jamie and Ernie's comments. Um, really more, more and more to, uh, the, you know, funds and syndications, you know, when you're doing your due diligence, you know, just like Jamie said, trust, but verify, you know, verify that the operators, the so-called boots on the ground are actually are on the up and up and doing what they're supposed to be doing to make that fund or that syndication successful. Um, and, um, and don't let your, your, your short-term motivations, your short-term goals dictate how you go through this process of due diligence. Um, because you always got to look at the long term, and uh, and if you if you you know if you're looking at that upcoming tax bill and you're doing everything you can to get rid of that tax bill, and you let your due diligence slip just to try to get out of paying you know those taxes, you're going to set yourself up for failure every time. And so you got to look you got to look long term. Even if you're going to pay a little more taxes, you know on the short on the front end, at least you're not uh, you know losing your uh, proverbial shirt <laughs> in the long run. So. Mm. No doubt. Lots of wisdom in there. Now, we are some of the experts in the country when it comes to infinite banking, right? That's how most people even came to know us. And because of that, we ever see a lot of ways people are using IBC in their day-to-day -day life, in their investing journey, on their financial freedom path. And so I, I just want to hear some of those behind the scenes conversations. Man, this person is using their policy for fill in the blank. Um, Jamie, I'm going to start you with you and then we'll go Ernie and Matthew to, to round it out uh, and love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah. I mean, one of the coolest examples I can think of is, is actually a fairly currently current client. And, and they came to us for a couple of reasons, uh, looking to build passive income, but also wanting to control their cash flow. And through our process of, of coaching and talking, they have a, a need to repair both their primary home and a rental property that they have down at a beach resort area in, in kind of the East coast of the United States. And, um, they were planning on just paying cash for that. They had the cash sitting on the sideline and, and through our conversations, they realized that they could put that cash through an IBC system, put it into a, a life insurance policy, get it compounding over time. They were planning on getting some contractor financing and we're going to be paying a loan to somebody anyways. And they could actually borrow against that money within their own system to make the repairs that they were going to spend money on anyways, but never, essentially never lose the compounding growth on that dollar over time. And they, they would be able to pay themselves back versus paying it back to somebody else. So that was a, a really cool example of kind of thinking outside the box of, hey, we have this issue that has to be addressed anyways. What's the most advantageous way to keep that money flowing within our own ecosystem? And so that's, that's pretty exciting that they're going to be able to do that. Oh, the fact that you're able to uncover things that are already there and then to expand your mind, to be able to see how this can all benefit you instead of just being, uh, you know, a means to an end. That is, that is super, that that's the value of a coach, right? We, we talk about this in the infinite banking process. It is constantly expanding your mind to see those things that are already there. Ernie, how about you? Best IBC use case? I really love connecting with the people that we've known for a long time. And right at the beginning of the year, I had an opportunity uh, to help a couple, Russ, that you began helping 13 years ago, take the next step in their infinite banking journey. And what I loved about it was how this was now permeating its way through the family. And so what I mean is this couple in their early 60s um, had an inheritance come in. At that point, had implemented infinite banking on their lives, had insurance policies on him, on her, and had lent money to their son to help him start and begin operating a business, an active business for him. And so that loan gave them a need and an opportunity to create an insurance policy on him to secure their loan. 
So they started, quote unquote, infinite banking um, on that second generation with their son. But they have a daughter as well. And when the inheritance came in, they didn't need the money necessarily. There weren't deals out there just staring them in the face that they wanted to run out and go get. And so we put together a multi-generational legacy plan and took the inheritance and organized an insurance policy on their daughter and on their daughter's grandchildren and on their son's grandchildren. And so eight grandchildren in this family. That's an amazing team, amazing heritage. Um, so created nine additional insurance policies with that lump sum of money, but also gave them a runway with that lump sum for them to fund those insurance policies for the next seven or eight years. I can't remember exactly which one. And so with that, <laughs> that sped up the conversation in the family about how to begin using these insurance policies. And by the time we got done setting this all up, their oldest grandchild, who is uh, starting, actually is now at school, now that I think about it, is at school at Auburn, we were game planning how he would take care of his housing. And the, those parents being interested in buying a property for the son to live in with roommates and the, the banking conversation began, which was, hey, if we buy this property, how should we organize the money from the grandparents giving the down payment for the parents to own the house? And then when the grandson gets in there, should he pay rent or should he live for free and let the other people, the roommates pay rent or not? And so we're just talking through how that, how it's good for there to be clear agreements within the family and how it is good for that grandson to pay rent for the place that he's living in college because he would absolutely have to pay rent elsewhere. And so that kind of conversation, banking with the family was really exciting for me to be a part as we were solving that that family's inheritance. So awesome to see the legacy happening in front of your eyes, right? That is, that's the power of this and, and being able to see the, the transfer of knowledge. It's not just the transfer of assets that will happen at a later date. It is the transfer of that knowledge and you've created a system for them that does it, does it make it like required to happen? but it certainly gives you an excuse to start having those conversations. That's what I love about uh, what we do in, in light of legacy. Matthew, how about you round us out the best way you've seen people use IBC this year? You know, I'm, I'm going to kind of go back on, on mine. Uh, I'm going to go back to simple, you know, keep it simple. Uh, I helped a client um, set up a policy at the end of last year. And uh, she was, you know, it was, it was a, it was a process and, you know, we struggled through underwriting and everything, but she was so excited when we got to that finish line. And, and so when I had the, when I had the call with her after, after everything was said and done, I asked her, I said, so, so what are you, uh, you have anything on your radar as far as, you know, what are you going to use a uh, policy loan for, you know, to, uh, to get the, get the ball rolling. And I was expecting her to come up with a, you know, I'm going to buy a property, buy a rental property, or I'm going to invest in this, invest in that. <clears throat> No, she said something very, very simple, and it just brought me all the way back to the beginning when I started IBC. She said, you know what? Probably my first policy loan. My daughter is turning 15, and she's going to be getting her license soon, and so I think I'm going to take out a policy loan to buy a car for her. And, you know, it just, it, I loved it. I love the simplicity of it. Um, you know, Nelson mentions it. You guys mentioned it in your in your uh, videos as well. You know, just, just this simple task of purchasing a car, something so simple with, uh, with, uh, your IBC system. And so because she's able to do that, she's able to buy that car. You know, if she's late on a few payments, you know, here and there, she doesn't have to worry about, uh, every time she sees a tow truck rounding the corner, she doesn't have to worry about <laughs> wondering if that tow truck's coming after her car. Um, the car is always going to be safe because the family, the family bank owns that car. And I just love the simplicity of the plan and I love the power of the plan uh, and, and just in that simple use case. It, it is. And when I've seen that personally with my you know, two daughters where we've used uh, loans against our cash values at these insurance companies to purchase those cars and be able to as assign those, those dollars that they have seen growing in those accounts over the years and say, this is how you're, you're doing it now. We need to replenish that, right? We can't steal the peas that we can't buy liabilities and, and become wealthy. There are unfortunately people out there in our industry that make that 
that statement, and it's an untrue statement. You can't buy li liabilities and, and create wealth. You have to buy assets. But if you can use these cash values to buy liabilities and use assets to replenish the loans back, and that's kind of what we're doing now. So my my big, hairy, audacious goal for 2024 is that my girls would use their cash values to buy a cash flowing business. And the one that we're after right now, we'll see if we actually pull the trigger is a content website that produces monthly income and that they will use those cash values uh, to, to purchase it and then use the reoccurring revenue coming from those sites to replenish the loans for that as also to help them replenish the loans that we use to buy those cars. Cause bro, we got to do that. I mean, we, we get, we got some holes to fill here in stallion. All right. I want to hear each one of your big, hairy, audacious goals, because this is the way that we grow is when we share it with the world. And um, it helps you as you listen to this, come up with your own, maybe a goal that may be big and uh, outrageous for your own self. Jamie, I'll let you go first. What's your BHAG for this 20, uh, for this year in 2024? Well, I think BHAGs start, go back to mindset. It starts with a vision, right? Are you clear on what you want in life and what the vision is and what we're trying to accomplish? And, and my wife and I went through this process and, and I do it yearly. I try and bring her into it yearly as well, but we went through it last year. And one of our uh, kind of overlapping visions was that we both want a property on the lake at some point in time in our, in our lifetime. And so putting that into my mind started the creative kind of wheels churning on how can we get that property sooner rather than later. Um, didn't talk about this deal earlier, but I've been around a lot of people in the real estate space and some of the coolest deals I've seen are actually seller finance deals where people use equity and other properties plus a seller finance package to actually get into a property. I don't have a crystal ball, but I would think that we're moving in 2024 potentially into some opportunity to find some sellers who want to get out of properties. I have equity in other properties. So my big ha BHAG is to find an opportunity to get into a lake house and potentially do it in a seller finance deal where I can leverage my equity in my other properties to get into um, get into a lake house. We would turn that into a, a mixture of a short-term rental, vacation style rental uh, with some personal use kind of thrown in there. Um, my wife is an Auburn grad, loves that school, wants to be close to that school, thinks our kids are going to college there at some point in the future. I'm still not convinced that they're going to college at all, but that's a conversation for another day. We have many years in the future, but how cool would it be if we could go in and get that, that property into the family, have somebody else pay off or pay down the debt for the next 10 years while they make that decision um, and then figure out what to do with it at that point in time. Mm, love that. Come come on, bro. There, there's, a, there's a house near me. I'll have to, I'll have to show you soon, okay? Come on. <laughs> All right, Erd, how about you, man? What's your BHAG? for 2024? I think Big Harry, you know, I think that was like made for me. I, I love these things. So the scary out there, I think it, and I think, I think it's possible. I want to get to where my passive income exceeds 200% of my monthly expenses by the end of next year. Um, so that um, Caroline and I's goal in that it, when we get there is to be able to take our passive income and give 50% of it to the things that we really care about and want to be involved in and live on the other 50%. We want to take the active income that I earn and tithe on that, but then use the rest of it to continue to do more deals. And that uh, lifestyle uh, is something that I'm anxious to get to. We just need to solve that math problem. And I think it's attainable in uh, 2024. And it's going to take a lot of work and a lot more land deals to get there, but I think we can do it. That's super cool. I love that. Matthew, how about you, man? What's your, what's your BHAG this year? Well, I will say, um, you know, I had a, a new experience at the end of 2023. Um, my wife, Angie and I, we celebrated our 10 year wedding anniversary. And we went on a cruise uh, to celebrate our anniversary. And the entire cruise and everything involved was paid for by my short-term rental business. And so, you know, I like that. 
<laughs> I like the the cash flowing in and just immediately like, you know, upgrading our lifestyle as a result. And so kind of going to Ernie's point, you know, being able to to build up that passive income to be able to to fund our lifestyle so that we're not we're not tied down to a, you know, a an hourly paycheck, so to speak, you know, so that we can actually have that time freedom back. And uh, the next step in building that passive income, actually, um, I have actually decided I was going to buy a an online business uh, like you, Russ, uh, with your daughters. Um, I was going to buy an online business and I was looking at some businesses that I could purchase myself. And then I thought, you know, how much bigger could I get, get into if I were to partner with some folks? And so we actually I actually partnered with some folks in our community and we were actually looking at an online business as we speak. Um, it's in the due diligence phase and, uh, you know, whether we pull the trigger on this one or pull the trigger on the next one, I'm so excited about this year, uh, because, uh, I think, I think that's going to be the, the key to, to building up my passive income to that point where I can, you know, we can, my, my wife and I can upgrade our lifestyle. I love that. This is what it's all about, right? Finding the things that we want, finding ways to supply it and then being able to give generously through that, right? In order to give, you got to have something to give. So um, what, what an amazing goal. So if you're sitting here listening to this and you haven't set BHAGs for yourself, you haven't created passive income that exceeds your monthly expenses or 200%, as Ernie said, you have an opportunity. If you need help strategizing through that, you want to shortcut the process. You want to avoid all the mistakes that people make. You want to get access to the insight and the information that exists within the minds of these coaches, go to what's about wall street.com for slash free call. And you can set up a time to where you can start coaching and start getting the first step or the right next step for you on your journey to becoming financially free. Have an amazing day. This has been the wealth without wall street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the wall street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.